I consider myself more professional than a than a uh, academic, um, and I a lot of my research has been by uh, surveying other uh, uh, news executives and PR executives. Um, most recently, a survey of uh, uh, that that achieved uh, over 700 responses from executives of American. Uh, news media and PR agencies or PR organizations um, because I want to know what they think. Um, now, you all probably aren't all going to get uh, jobs in, in America, uh, but uh, one of my master's students in Kazakhstan kind of replicated uh, my study in Kazakhstan and found the same results, um, what the executives want. And a lot of them, frankly, have not been real happy with the uh, the graduates of, of journalism programs. Um, in fact, most of them are, have not been happy uh, with the, the uh, quality of, of journalism graduates. Um, in fact, uh, I remember the first time I did a study of this was when I was in my master's program, uh, which uh, was ages and ages ago. Uh, and uh, some of the editors, uh, th that first survey was of magazine edi uh, editors in America, and some of the magazine editors said they'd rather hire a math student, a math graduate, than a journalism graduate. Um, that was kind of extreme and not, not, does not represent the majority opinion, but there were a lot of them said they would just soon have a liberal arts graduate, an English graduate, or somebody else. So it was with that background, uh, and also part of my own background, I found that uh, I could take, um, when I was uh, publishing newspapers, I could hire people who had never had a journalism class before, and uh, within a short time have them trained up, becoming uh, award-winning journalist. And so sitting in this class doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily going to give you a big advantage or somebody who's not sitting in this class uh, if you don't take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, and the opportunity uh, really to me is to get as much hands-on experience and, and as many skills as you can get. Um, I was, uh, I've told some of you and uh, uh, it, it's uh, impacted me, uh, my career and my orientation towards education. Uh, when I was uh, while I was still finishing my master's degree, and this was in uh, 1977, a long time ago, uh, before you guys were born. Um, I was uh, done with my coursework and working on a very difficult thesis project. And I was uh, also then editor and publisher of a group of suburban newspapers in uh, central Utah. And uh, the owner um, of the small chain that I was uh, publishing uh, wanted to sell them. It was a difficult time financially uh, in that period of time, uh, uh, kind of different but similar in impact to the 2008 uh, recession. And so he decided to sell his newspapers and, a, and uh, two representatives from a larger chain came in to look at our books and to look at our organization and decide whether or not they wanted to buy them. And. Uh, uh, I guess before I tell you the end of that story, you have to understand that, like I said, I had already worked a couple of years as uh, a reporter and editor at a, at a weekly newspaper of about uh, 120,000 circulation, competing against daily newspapers in Tampa, Florida. I bought my own newspaper. Um, I had to learn everything about that newspaper. I had to sell the ads. I had to write the stories. I had to do the design. I had to do everything. I had one part-time receptionist who basically if uh, somebody sent in a press release or something, I have her type that into the, into the system. Um, but mostly, I had to do it myself. Um, but uh, I took on the challenge, and uh, also um, one of the reasons why I really support our, our department's idea of starting also a, an advertising PR uh, major is because during that time, I had to become a PR advertising expert in order to survive. I had to sell the ads. If I didn't sell the ads, I would go broke and I would be walking away from my newspaper, uh, having lost money and time in my career. And so I had to become uh, somewhat of an expert in advertising. Because when you're a newspaper publisher or 
or responsible for a news medium like that, again, that's how you make your money. Uh, you get very, you're lucky if your subscriptions pay for themselves as far as their distribution cost. Um, and so most of your income uh, and any profit is going to come from your advertising. Um, so um, I had, I, fortunately, I stumbled onto some ideas, I brainstormed, whatever, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about how to make this uh, newspaper prosperous. And I was successful. I doubled its revenue in one year and sold it for a nice profit after the second year because I wasn't really quite what I wanted to do. And I took that profit and went and got my master's degree. And then, as I said, as I finished my coursework, I was hired to be an editor and publisher uh, of, of a small group of newspapers where I was also doing advertising and, and management and, and uh, design, newspaper design uh, and wrote a lot of the most important stories. Um, so in come these guys uh, to decide whether or not they wanted to hire or wanted to uh, uh, buy the newspapers. And they took me to lunch and said, Ken, um, these newspapers, uh, the offer that you're, that the owner's uh, making us is not that good. Um, okay, but not that good. Uh, but you're a good deal. They're not a good deal, you're a good deal. Because in our chain of newspapers, we can find people who, with journalism background to make publishers. We can find people with advertising background to make, make them our publishers. We cannot find people like you who have both journalism and advertising background to make our, to become our publishers. And so if you agree to become a, uh, a part owner and, and stay with the organization, then we will buy the newspapers for you. Um, otherwise, uh, we don't want them. Well, I had uh, just agreed to take my first professorial job, and so I turned them down. Um, and I thought about that choice many times since then because I would have probably been rich by now if I had said yes, but I would have lost a lot of the experiences that I had as a professor, which I kind of prefer. So my point is this, the more skills you get, the more experience you get, um, the more especially hands-on opportunity you have, the more likely you're going to be successful. And actually that was in, like I say, uh, 1980. It's become much more so today. Because in 1980, we didn't have to worry about learning video. We didn't have to learn about learning social media and the internet and web, how to, you know, web design. We just had to learn how, how to, in my case, I learned how to write well, I learned how to design well, I learned how to, to produce a newspaper, and I learned how to sell advertising. That was it. Um, and, uh, and that was their response to me then. Now there's so many other skills that, that are important to your success it has actually amplified the value of your taking this, this uh, career opportunity extremely seriously and, and understanding that you will be successful if you do those sorts of things. If you become uh, you know, multi-skilled and have in the multimedia, but also maybe, again, if we start this major, start classes in advertising PR, take some of those classes. Um, because those experiences for me were some of the most valuable, even though I considered myself a journalist the whole time, uh, that was important. In this class, you're going to get more into the technology of, it's not just the print media, because the, the best online publications are achieved with desktop publishing, uh, where you create really high quality PDFs. And PDFs are not going to disappear. They're going to be a, a, a primary uh, online resource uh, for decades, if not centuries, uh, into the future. So uh, those same PDFs, if I produce a newspaper um, that looks really nice and everything, what I do then is I send that PDF, um, typically, sometimes you send the whole file, but typically I just sign, uh, send the PDF to a printer. Not everybody can have a big enough printer uh, to, to, for themselves, for their own newspaper, especially well, even the newspaper, the daily newspaper I used to work for, um, had 50,000 circulation. It might be down to 40,000 now. When their press stopped working, uh, you know, their press was like a $50 million press. When they suddenly needed repairs, they decided it wasn't worth buying another press. And so they now go, they send their newspaper by PDF to a competing newspaper, semi kind of semi competing newspaper about 
almost 100 miles away, but they overlap in their in their coverage area. They send theirs to the other city and have that newspaper print it for them and ship it back uh, same same night uh, in a truck for them to distribute uh, because presses are so expensive nowadays and they're going to disappear. You may spend fifty million dollars on a press this year and you know is it going to be of value to you in five years from now? It may not be. You may shut it down totally. A lot of the newspapers have to look at shutting down their press, prints, uh, presses at some point. So anyway, that's a little bit of my background, but also a little bit of my rationale why I will make you write stories, will make you, uh, why we're doing the editing class within the environment of desktop publishing. Uh, the most popular desktop publishing system right now is InDesign. Uh, but in uh, the 1980s, the two most popular were the predecessor of InDesign, uh, PageMaker, and Quark Express. Quark Express was built for Macintoshes, and PageMaker was built for Windows-operated systems. And so for a while, they were diverged. They, weren't, they did not overlap. Um, at the daily newspaper I was at, I, well, I'm kind of a Windows person. That's, uh, I, I've mostly, you know, they're cheaper. I've bought, you know, owned lots of computers. So I've kind of gone with Windows. But in those days especially, and still to some degree, Macintosh is considered a, a, a higher quality computer. And with that, uh, our newspaper bought a bunch of the most powerful Macintosh computers um, and big screens, and we use Quark Express, which is what we're going to use in our uh, system here because um, InDesign, because they have a monopoly in the market right now, uh, they, they cost, I can't remember the, anyway, in, within two years, we could buy it, pay full price for the Quark Express and own and, and cover uh, excuse me, in two years of paying for the license fee, you don't even own the, the license with InDesign anymore. It's, uh, you're now just buying a license, you're, you're paying them a license fee which you have to pay them every year forever. And in two years of their license fee, you can pay the professional cost of Quark Express. But in our case, they're gonna sell us a thousand licenses for a thousand dollars. And that's basically not much, much, that's a cost that when you could buy the InDesign software, it almost cost a thousand dollars. I say they don't even option that anymore, they won't sell it to you anymore, they will sell you the license. Um, so Quark Express is much cheaper, but it is, um, some people think better than InDesign, but it just lost the market. Uh, it was right there, in fact it was, like I say, the preferred product for professionals um, in the 19, uh, late 1980s and the 1990s. Uh, most newspapers, if they're going to, to desktop publish at all, at that point they went to Quark Express, not to InDesign, not to PageMaker, its predecessor. Um, so if you learn, even if you, well, let me take one more uh, stab at this. Obviously, Quark is trying to win back their market share. That's why they're selling us a thousand licenses for a thousand dollars. They want you all to learn Quark Express so that maybe you can influence the market as you go out in the real world. Um, so uh, that's that's their perspective. They're selling it dirt cheap to us uh, so that we will teach you this. But once you learn any desktop publishing system, you can adapt to others. It's not that hard. They're very they're very similar. As I said, some think that Quark is better than InDesign now. As a newspaper publisher, the last newspaper I started was uh, about 15 years ago. And we, I and uh, other people in our, that I had hired for the newspaper all tested uh, InDesign and we actually did not like it as well as its predecessor, PageMaker. We chose at that time PageMaker was still available. We stayed with PageMaker because we thought it was faster, easier, we could get our job done faster. In a newspaper business, uh, speed is as important as quality, and it, the quality was not that much less. It was minimally less than InDesign. InDesign, from my perspective at that time, was built for professional designers. 
not newspaper journalist. Uh, and they kind of pushed newspaper journalists aside and said, well, we're going to make this product and force it on you, whether you like it or not, uh, whether it's as easy to use and as quick as, as uh, PageMaker, it doesn't matter. They stopped selling their PageMaker product and made everybody go to InDesign. Um, so even, the, you know, in our use of InDesign, or, or our option, we chose not to use InDesign. Now, we did use InDesign at the last university I was at. We, we purchased that, and our students there are learning InDesign. But uh, it's actually, again, not my first choice, even among the potential Adobe products, I would still rather have PageMaker. Uh, so, uh, and knowing PageMaker, it wasn't that hard to move to InDesign, but it still isn't as fast. Uh, PageMaker was faster, and a journalist needs speed. Uh, so they ignored the industry as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Um, we're going to, I'm going to try to give you our, our uh, what I'm going to call week's learning objective. Um, each uh, week in this class, uh, in this uh, uh, lecture where everybody shows up. Uh, the thing that I, I want you to start to learn this week are first off to be able to explain uh, the editor's functions uh, within a print environment. Again, I say print environment because we're going to focus on desktop publishing, which is used for print products, but it's also in the future will, well, still, it's right now used for uh, online PDFs. And actually Quark has incorporated into its program, I'm not sure how much we'll use it, um, but I'm sure we're going to at least uh, test it. Um, because I haven't used this function yet, it has now made it so that you can use Quark Express to build HTML5 web pages. HTML5 is, is a critical step in web design because it is, with HTML5, you can make all of your web pages mobile friendly. Uh, HTML4 is it's, it's not as easy to make your material mobile friendly and as you all, I'm sure, have been uh, told and understand uh, if you're not mobile friendly going forward, uh, you might not survive um, with, if you're a news product uh, because everybody's going mobile. And uh, that is the future. So um, I know that InDesign has some capability like that also. I'm just not sure. Ex uh, I haven't used it with InDesign either uh, because I was concentrating on the print product uh, rather than the online product. But we will play with that and maybe even create a new class to use our Quark Express for creating web pages uh, as an option, and maybe do some other use some other web programs as well. Uh, in in uh, I don't think we currently have a course available to you to to uh, build websites, and so that I think is important also. Okay, the second one. Um, is to be able to identify good story ideas uh, for the Shyman uh, target audience and what sources and questions are needed to enhance the newsworthiness of any of those stories. Um, I'm doing this because we're working into, each one of you is going to write a news story. Most of you have taken some sort of course in news writing or, or, or even in my course, uh, my history course, you learned some news writing from me. Um, and you cannot be an editor without being a good news writer, without understanding the principles of good news writing. Because your job is, you're the last stop. Um, a, a, a reporter can hand you in a mess, and they can survive if they're a really good reporter. Um, some of my best students, um, reporters, were ter terrible writers. At least their spelling and grammar was terrible. But they were excellent reporters. And in a newspaper, a, a reporter like that might survive being having poor spelling and grammar, but you can't survive if you're an editor and don't know how to write, because that's your job to make sure that every story comes out looking great. Um, that it's not just the spelling and grammar, but some of these other questions. Um, did they talk to the right sources? Uh, did they ask the right questions? I mentioned that first job, I was competing with daily newspapers. There were a, a big chain of newspapers in America owned two newspapers in Tampa, Florida. One that came out in the morning was their big one, Tampa Tribune. The other one in the afternoon, the Tampa Times. 
So we were competing against two daily newspapers and TV stations and so forth. Tampa is a major market in America. Uh, we had high circulation because we were free circulation. And so they had, I think the Tampa Tribune had about 70,000 circulation at that time. We had 120,000 circulation. But it was free, which um, made advertisers skeptical. How, many, how were, people, were people really reading the newspaper? And frankly, they had reason to be skeptical. Any new news product has to win the audience over. If it does not attract readers, uh, and they're used to getting all their news from the daily newspaper or other sources, then basically you can put out 120,000 newspapers and you might be lucky to get 20,000 readers, uh, especially the first few weeks. And, and the, the newspaper uh, publisher that I was working for made one of the stupidest mistakes ever. He, went to, he, he already had a good relationship with major advertisers because he had won their printing contact, contracts to print flyers for them. And so he had excellent relationship with major advertisers, big uh, grocery store chains and, and department stores. Uh, he had excellent contacts. He was ready to really make this newspaper fly. And so he went out and, and got them all to buy that first week, claiming that they were going to have 70,000 readers in the first week. He was an idiot. Uh, because if anything, you should lie the other direction. They never got to 70,000. They, they didn't have an organization that could put out 70,000. And if they did put out 70,000, they might be lucky to get 5,000 readers the first week. That's the nature of the news business. If you don't have a habit of reading that newspaper and somebody throws it on your doorstep, it does not mean you're going to read the thing. Uh, you have to convince them to read you. And that can take months uh, of excellent writing and, and so forth to get people to pick up your newspaper and build the habit of reading your news. And so the publisher was an idiot to claim he was going to put 70,000 out the first week and suggest that they were all going to be read. Not going to happen. And so he didn't put out 70,000. Uh, he put out probably half of that. The, new, the advertisers, uh, within a very short time, realized he was lying to them or that it was a terrible product, whatever. Their advertising was not drawing any, any uh, uh, buyers, any consumers, and they refused to ever come back to the newspaper in most cases. So the, the, what he should have done is put out 50,000 and claimed he was putting out 10,000 and working towards 50,000. He should have lied the other direction uh, because the way he did it, he destroyed his, basically ultimately destroyed the newspaper by lying the first week. Um, so anyway, uh, what I was getting to though, however, is part of what I was doing and competing with the daily newspapers was I decided, you know, how do I, you know, how do I cover really important stories that there are, they are already going to be covering? They're a daily newspaper. I'm a weekly newspaper. Uh, they're going to get to the story before I do in most cases if it's an important story. How do I beat them? And by the way, I had the same situation later when I started a, a weekly newspaper against the new daily newspaper I used to work for. Uh, same situation. How does a weekly beat a daily? When a daily has, uh, the daily has lots of income, they have, uh, well, the daily that I worked for had 50 people in their newsroom, and I was competing with them with three uh, news writers or maybe some stringers. Um, but just a handful of people writing anything. Uh, and in the case of in Tampa, they probably had, in the Tribune and the larger newspaper, they, they probably had well over 100 journalists. And I had myself and two other writers. Uh, we had a, to three writers um, gain readers against the competition of 100 journalists. Well, I, it really is part of this question. Uh, I had to go and I would look at what they wrote and I'd ask myself what questions did they not answer? Uh, and very frequently, as some of you, I've told some of you, and uh, not in this context, but I've, I've mentioned that to me the two most important questions are how and why. And what I found in competing with the daily newspapers is they were always, always in such a hurry they never covered how and why very well. It, how and why could always be covered better than the daily newspapers covered it. 
uh, almost always. And it, it got to where when I was then flash forward again, you know, 20, 30 years, whatever it was, when I was competing against the, the daily paper I had formerly worked for, uh, I was doing well enough that they, had, they would have brainstorming sessions to try to figure out how to get ahead of me. I didn't have to think how to get ahead of them, they had to think of how to get ahead of me. Because I was taking the stories that they had access to and I was doing them better than they could do them. Um, maybe partly because I'm a better writer, I don't know, I'd like to think that. But more importantly, I'm a better thinker. I was thinking about these questions. What are they not asking? What can I, uh, how can I get into the depth that makes my stories sing? They'll get people to read my stories uh, and get more out of them. Um, and that's in what questions you're gonna ask. And those how and why questions are the ones that I found were uh, always the ones that they were missing out on. So if I went to a city council meeting, I would um, listen to their questions, by the way. I'd stand around and the, the, the TV stations and the daily newspapers would stand, they would be asking questions. I'd just be taking notes off of their questions. Uh, plus, I'd read their newspaper the next day or listen to TV. So I'd know what they got. And then I would go back later and talk to the same people and ask the questions they didn't ask. And again, very frequently, how and why. So if, for example, uh, the city council decided to raise taxes, they might touch a little bit on the why based on the conversation within the council meeting. But I would spend 30 minutes talking to, to uh, each of several city councilmen and get their complete rationale why they could justify raising taxes when no taxpayer ever wants a raised tax. Uh, that's just part of, the, you know, of, of a democracy. The voters are not gonna like a raised tax. They, I've never seen a voter say, yes, raise my taxes. Not gonna happen. So why would they do that? Um, and how will their raised taxes improve our society? So I would ask those sorts of questions uh, that would be covered so minimally uh, by the daily papers. Even in a fire story. I remember uh, rewriting a fire story. The fire story came in maybe that long in the daily paper in a column that wide. Not a very long story. But it didn't ask, answer any of the how or why questions. You know, how did this start? Uh, um, why did it take you so long to get the, the fire trucks there to, to stop the fire? You know, questions like that. And so I could take a story that long from the daily paper and make it this long with more detail from, from, the, uh, uh, from the how and why questions, for example. Um, okay, so that's part of what I want you to think about this week is how do you come up with a good story idea because you are going to write one story, just one. The other, other reason why you're writing one story is when we get into the desktop publishing and the design, I want you to be using your stories. Not stories I've written myself or stories that other students have written. I want you to be using your stories. And so I want you to, be, I want you to write one story at the start of the semester and we'll use that story, those stories, the 90 stories or whatever come out of this class uh, in building a newspaper, which we will put online um, for your fellow students to read. So stories do need to have an appeal to Chiman students. Uh, that does not necessarily mean it has to be about the university, uh, even about, you know, the, about the university students, nor the university professors. It could, but students have more interest than that. Uh, many of our students are from China, so a, a story that somehow relates to China, but you also be thinking about your sources. I don't want your source to be the newspaper, another newspaper. You have to come up with your own sources. But a, a story even about something going on in China would be relevant to a large portion of our students, for example. Um, or we have, you know, the situation, um, I, 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 as I understand it, the, the uh, final selection of a new prime minister has not been made yet. That's a big story for particular, particularly people in Malaysia. Uh, does that affect you? Yeah, you should be interested in that. Um, so, um, a story of interest to the Chiman tar uh, ta target audience does not have to be based in the university or directly about the university. It has to be of interest to a large portion of our students. That's what I'm looking for. 
So there's a reason for it to be in a Chiman University newspaper uh, because we write to our audience. We adapt everything. Uh, every newspaper is trying to figure out how do we get the most readership. And indeed, going back to the advertising side, that's what you're really selling. When you sell an ad, you're selling people's attention. That's what you're selling. If you have, don't have people's attention, as going back to Tampa, they didn't have people's attention. You can print as many newspapers as you want to. If you can't sell people's attention, you have nothing to sell. And so for a news medium to be successful, it has to have people's attention. That's what you're selling. And so while they're reading your news story, they get exposed to the advertising and so forth. That's what you sell, news attention. So you are competing in the news business with each other. You're competing with other media. And how successful you are in this business will depend on you knowing how to get people's attention. That's what you're doing. Um, that's one reason, not just because I figured out a way to sell advertising better, but that's one reason why I was able to double the revenue of my first newspaper. Because I knew how to get people's attention, and the previous publisher and editor did not know how to do that. They were not very good at that. And so um, I got their attention, and then I sold their attention to advertisers and taught the advertisers how to take advantage of their attention. Because advertisers aren't very smart sometimes when they buy advertising. They don't know how to take advantage of that advertising and make it really worth their while. And so many of them waste their money. So my job as an editor and publisher, get their attention, sell that attention to the advertisers and teach the advertisers how to, how to take advantage of that attention. If they don't have it, their ads are worthless. So that was the key to my success uh, at an early age. Okay. Anyway, you know my name, and I, you know that I don't care if you call me Ken, Dr. Ken, Dr. Harvey. Ken is my, my given name. Harvey is my family name. Um, some people have a hard time with, the, with Harvey. Um, and so that's one reason why I always, when I worked overseas, I just asked people to go ahead and use my first name, Ken. My full name is actually Kenneth, but that's also hard for some people, so just Ken. Is my is what in the bare my family calls me. Um, so whatever you feel comfortable with, I know some students don't feel. There was a debate on on uh, LinkedIn among professors whether or not it's appropriate for students to be allowed to call you by your first name. Uh, the, the reason I justify it is what I said before: is I consider myself more a professional than a professor. And if I went into my newsroom and said, everybody has to call me Dr. Ken, they'd probably throw me out the window. Um, and that is one reason why w one of the questions in my surveys to the professionals was if you could hire somebody with a master's degree or somebody with a doctor's degree, everything else being equal. That's the only difference. One has a higher degree than the other one. Which one would you hire? Master's degree. They don't want the doctor's degree around. Uh, so if I were to actually go look for a job in the industry, I would leave my doctor's degree out of my CV. Uh, because to put it in there would, would probably ensure that I did not get the job. Uh, so um, doctor degrees are not valued in the industry unless it's a very specific like research type publication. Uh, it had to be very specific. But the majority of publications in the real world do not want a doctor's degree around. They do not respect them. They do not value them. Um, so if I'm in a newsroom, I'm not going to have you call me Dr. Ken. You're not going to know I have a doctor's degree. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. Um, because I probably won't get the job. I won't be in the newsroom <laughs> if I tell them I have a doctor's degree. Because uh, it was a, a large percentage favored the masters over the doctors. Um, I put my information up there. You're welcome to uh, befriend me on Facebook. A lot of my students from Kazakhstan uh, still communicate with me on a regular basis, uh, get my letters of reference on a regular basis, things like that. Uh, however, if you befriend me, you have to understand that I'm going to probably say some stuff in Facebook that may be controversial, um, and that just comes with the territory. So I'm not telling you to befriend me. I'm inviting you to, but I say things that you may disagree with. 
my sister unfriended me. To give you an idea. So, um, so anyway, take that as, a, as you may want to. So that's my other contact information. Um, I've done a lot of things by multitasking. So I sometimes was uh, a daily, when I was a daily newspaper editor, I was also ran the journalism program for the local university. Um, and I, so I double up on lots of times. I'm kind of workaholic. And so when you add all this up, it looks like I'm about 100 years old. And I'm not quite that. Getting close, but not quite. Um, this was, again, these are desktop published products. This was a bilingual newspaper I produced. Uh, it was actually paid for by the state of Washington. So it wasn't a commercial product. It was, you could actually say it was PR. Uh, I wrote it like a journalist. I did all the interviews uh, in English or Spanish, wrote the stories, did the design, and so forth. Uh, and uh, it was published and distributed about 20,000 copies to educators and, and migrant parents um, and students and so forth. Um, so I, I definitely, one reason why I was able to get the contract, before me the, for over 10 years, the previous contractor was one of the most highly esteemed Hispanics in the state of Washington. So if there was going to be a bias, it was going to be a bias in front of him because I'm not a Hispanic, if you didn't notice. Um, but I was able to go in and offer much more because I knew how to do everything myself. And he had to hire people to do his stuff. So he was publishing 5,000 and distributing 5,000 papers. I offered to publish and distribute 20,000 papers. He was putting out 12 pages of tabloid. I said I would average uh, 18 pages of tabloid. So um, I basically made it so they couldn't not hire me. It was my proposal. But a lot of that was because I knew desktop publishing. I knew how to write the stories. I knew how to uh, do everything I needed to do, and he didn't know how to do that. He had to hire people to do his stuff, so he couldn't make as good an offer. So again, going back to building your skills as broadly as you can. Uh, this was a the last weekly newspaper ad, so it, it's more of a kind of like the Star. It's a news mag. It, the front page is more has a appearance of a news magazine, but it's uh, uh, anyway. It is what it is. So that's some of our front pages. Um, this one was a, is a uh, entertainment magazine that I then purchased uh, and then redid and developed. It's still in publication, uh, but my um, somebody I hired to work with me before is, is doing it and while I'm here around the world. Uh, news website. I uh, I don't keep up with this as much as I'd like to. I have put my blog into it, and then I have liberal new, news sources on the left, conservative news sources on the right uh, that I use their um, uh, RSP uh, feed uh, to uh, let people link into uh, whichever stories they want to link into. I publish books um, for the last uh, seven years or so. I, uh, well, I launched a program in Kazakhstan uh, to help train non-government organizations and how to communicate better. And then that spread to more skills besides just communication. And now nearly $10 million of, uh, of uh, grant funding since then, which covers all of the Central Asia uh, from Kazakhstan to Azerbaijan um, and down to Pakistan. And so I'm a co-editor of, of a yearly book uh, about the best practices in NGO. And again, we you know, use desktop publishing to do that. Um, I co-authored, or is actually the, well, uh, some of you know uh, Shiogi uh, Shu that was here before. He resigned uh, after I got here. He's the one that recruited me to come here. He was the editor of this book. Uh, and I wrote or co-authored co seven of the chapters, which made me the most uh, prolific of his, of his writers, which is why he wanted me to come here to work with him on that. <coughs> websites, I design and build websites, maintain websites, lots of websites. Um, anyway. And I use those skills in marketing. 
So this was uh, with a company called SEM Consultants, was a technical consulting firm. And so in the 1990s, I was mostly doing um, PR marketing because my children were of an age that they needed to see dad a little more often, teenagers. And uh, at the daily newspaper, I would go, uh, first off, I'd go to the, you know, the university in the morning, like from 10 to two or three, I'd be at the university running their journalism program. And then in the afternoon at three or four o'clock, I'd go to the daily newspaper and I would be there until two, until, well, after one, about 1.30 in the morning, I'd be heading home, I'd be lucky to, uh, but well, that was partly because I made a deal with the, uh, the executive editor that if he gave me a two hour break so I could see my children once a day, uh, I would be the late editor, so I was the last one out the door to make sure there weren't any serious mistakes in the newspaper. Uh, but then I had an opportunity to go into PR marketing, and I took my skills over there and was very successful in PR marketing. So your, your skills you learn in this program can lead other places. I did not ever expect to go into PR marketing, but then as I said, as a publisher, I automatically was in marketing. I had to be a marketer. Um, and so I took those skills and then applied them in, in a corporate setting and uh, did very well with that. And I uh, also learned uh, right now the most popular type of advertising online that uh, some people are projecting will be 75% of all display advertising on the internet by 2021 is what they call native advertising. Native advertising is advertising that blends in with the content around it. So on Facebook, you'll see sponsored content mixed in with in your timeline with, with what's called organic, the, the regular postings. Uh, if they do a good job, they fool you and they don't, so you don't know that this is an ad. If they do a bad job, it's obvious it's an ad. But if they do a good job, they don't know it's an ad. Um, so in this one here, uh, the one on the right, Cotbus, um, that was one of my first ventures into advertising production. And this uh, um, city councilman was running against seven other people for mayor of Tampa. And uh, this is the sort of ads I started creating for him because he was dead last. With, about, with less than a month ago, out of eight candidates, he was last. Uh, that was in the primary election. So out of the primary, there would be two people go on to the general election. So in three weeks, I basically had to ra raise him from number eight to number two. And I did it with this type of advertising. This is native advertising. This is offline native advertising. Um, by the time I got done showing them what native advertising could do, the opposition party was asking me to work for them. Uh, I could have made a career out of native advertising. I didn't really even I didn't think about the, op the opportunity, but it was extremely effective in, in uh, bringing our, our candidate up. And then I basically used the same approach when I ran for city council then, and out of eight candidates that I was running uh, uh, that were involved in that election, I got the most votes with the least money, uh, because I knew how to do stuff with desktop publishing and other skills I learned as a journalist. Uh, so anyway. Okay, we talked about instructional approach already. I'm going to skip through that so that we can get on to other stuff. Um, I do want you to be involved. I want, your, I want this to be as hands-on as possible because that's how you know, how you remember stuff. That's how it becomes part of you. If all, you do, if all I do is stand up here and lecture, you will come out of here knowing nothing. That will stick with you, basically. Not much. And so we're not going to, we are going to lecture. This is our lecture section. Uh, and then we will, you, you will all be part of a tutorial section and that's where we get our hands dirty. That's where we're going to really work and, and uh, apply the skills that we'll talk about in here. We will apply in there and we're going to apply a lot of, uh, you know, do a lot of work. So the more involved you are, the more you will learn. The less involved you are, if you're just sitting here listening and that's all we did, you would leave this without much. I'm going to skip forward. Okay, you will have to sign up for our class. I, I've, uh, I've asked uh, the IT to make some adjustments so it's not ready quite yet. Uh, but uh, uh, hopefully by the end of today, you'll be able to start signing up for the, our Moodle uh, site. You all sign up in, in one big conglomeration, even though you're going to be in different tutorials. 
I think I'll just keep you on one site to uh, be easier for me. Uh, if you don't, haven't gotten into Moodle before, uh, you will uh, go here and you'll point at library. And uh, then from library, you'll uh, click on the information and find, uh, if you look down um, the list there, uh, you'll see Moodle, which is our, uh, our, our learning uh, management system. And uh, that'll take you here and give you some uh, other information about Moodle. And if you, uh, um, anyway, as you, you know, learn that, uh, learn ba the basics, if you don't know, you, most of you already know that, um, it will give you a chance then to enroll. Uh, if you click on this blue link up the top, and our password will be NE2018. So news editing 2018 basically will be your password to be able to enroll, self-enroll into the into our online um, Moodle. Of course, you come into here. This is our Moodle site. Now you sign in where it says log in. You sign in there with your student ID and your and uh, your password. Not the password I gave you. That's how you enroll. But uh, uh, you then. Uh, get into uh, you can go into the uh, front page so to speak of this and you go down towards the bottom it has Moodle quick guide and that will give you some instructions if you don't know already how to sign up for the class go to here it gives you some more instructions and uh, uh, well this it gives you some instructions then arrow down you know scroll down some more and uh, it says you know it has a quick start button and uh, then it'll, and it even has a video demonstration if you need that to how to proceed to sign up. Ultimately, you get uh, into this place where you have, uh, have to put in your enrollment key, which is the NE 2018 to enroll into the class. If you have any problems with that, most of the people in the room already have done that, so they can help you or I can help you. Some of IT can help you, but do that right away. Uh, and then after that, when you're signing in to, uh, uh, into our Moodle site, uh, it's again, your, your ID, and now in this case, your own password that you already have. Okay, we'll have lots of information on there. Um, let, me, uh, let me go ahead and pass this around. I'll start over here, I guess. Go ahead and just sign in. I did, uh, uh, print out a Excel spreadsheet yet. Go ahead and just sign in there. Uh, we're going to use four, in essence, four textbooks, four uh, resources for this. Our main one, or well, the biggest one, I don't know if it's the main one, it has a lot of detail in it. And uh, you all are going to help teach this book here. Uh, this is an old, a slightly older um, version of the one that's in the library, but you can find it in the library with his name, The Art of Editing. And I think one of the uh, writers of this has dropped out. I think may, maybe he died. I don't know. He's been the, one of the writers of the book for a long, long time. So I noticed one is gone, so retired or died or something. So uh, when you need to access this book, uh, I think there's at least two, two copies in the library and hopefully more. If somebody needs to borrow this one, I, like I said, it's a little bit older. Um, I think there's even a, I need to go back and make a copy of the, their table of contents. I think they made a change in their table, of, uh, in their chapters even. So this is uh, a little bit outdated. This one here uh, is, um, is also going to be used and also uh, a couple of you will get a chance to present content out of this to the rest of the class in the tutorial sessions by the way not in this class uh, not in this session um, and this uh, is very specifically about design and about some of the principles of design uh, I will uh, upload a digital copy of this um, this is for educational purposes and it was Produced actually with uh, American uh, government funding, uh, but uh, uh, by a Eastern European uh, university. Uh, so anyway, it's uh, 
anyway, so I'm going to put a copy of this. So everybody can see this. Uh, it'll be put uh, uploaded into Moodle. So that you will all have access to. Uh, besides that, uh, we will. Some of you have already uh, introduced you to the crash course in mass communications that I wrote. Um, we will go through that right here at the start of the semester because your first major project will be writing the new story. And the keys to getting a good grade is understanding what I have in my book. Um, and so we will actually this week we're going to we'll touch a little bit more on chapter one, which is very short. So I'll touch on what uh, what's important in chapter one right in this uh, lecture. Um, if I don't run out of time. Um, and uh, the, uh, maybe there's other chapters that some of you, at least I've shared the essence of those chapters with you and other, if you took my history class or whatever, because that was the principles I taught and how to uh, do the new stories I had you do were based on chapter two of that book. Um, and so chapter two will be uh, important. We'll go over that. Uh, chapter three is, I've not exposed you to before, is about news reporting. And that's also important as an edit editor to understand. It's also important for you in doing your story because now you're going to, your first assignment will be a news reporter. So you're not just writing, you're reporting. And so how to be a good reporter is important to you. One of your potential jobs or one of your jobs as an, ed as an editor, almost certainly, will be to manage reporters. Um, in a large organization, you don't report as an editor, you just manage reporters. Now, I've preferred, my preferred uh, parts of my career has been, have been where I've, got, I've been able to write and edit and design and even get involved in advertising. I like to do it all. Uh, so that's my preference, and that's, re that's only probably available if you're a weekly newspaper editor and publisher. Uh, for a daily, not likely. Um, I did a little bit of writing uh, for the daily newspaper I worked for, but just like, I don't know, three or four stories at most. I can't remember exactly um, in, in six years that I was there. So um, with the larger the organization, the less likely you're going to wear two hats, so to speak. You're, you're not probably going to, if you're an editor, you're not going to do a bunch of writing. Um, but you have to manage the writing. You have to edit the writing. You have to manage the reporters. And managing the reporters uh, is ultimately probably more important than, than the actual uh, copy editing that you do. I and mean, they're both very important. But if your reporters aren't doing a good job of looking for stories, then they're going to get beaten by somebody like me who figures out how to beat them, how to do a better job than a whole staff of reporters. Uh, so the function of the editor is to make sure they're covering their stories well. Uh, is one of their functions, and we'll talk about that a little more in a second. Uh, so uh, that will be the crash course will be on the Moodle site, so you can uh, refer to that. Um, and the uh, other, what else are you going to look at? Well, let's uh, keep going here. Forgetting what I'm, what I, what else I'm thinking of there. Okay. Anyway, so uh, in the crash course. Uh, we'll kind of crash through uh, some of this right now. Talk about chapter one. Editing skills, and as I mentioned, there's a number of crucial skills you need to understand, at least if you're doing international editing, uh, but most of these are also for local editing as well. And one is, like I said, news judgment. What is news? Uh, where do you find a good story? Uh, you need to n understand that uh, because now you, well, when I did that bilingual newspaper for seven years, I wrote 250 stories about migrant and bilingual education. How do you make 250 stories about one subject interesting? Well, you better figure that out or you're, they're not going to keep you on, on staff for, for seven years. Uh, I, would still, I might still be there except they uh, uh, ran out of money in 2008. That's when I ended that contract. And so uh, uh, they, they did, did away with the publication. Obviously, knowing spelling, grammar, and punctuation is important. Um, AP style. Associated Press is the biggest, uh, well, produces more news than any other news uh, uh, wire service. And the reason why they produce that, they, they have, just in comparison, 
uh, with uh, what's the British news service? It's giving my mind right now. Hey, babe. Anyway, the British news service. You'll come to me in a second. They have uh, like I can't remember exactly the number, but it's like it's more than five times as many employees as Associated Press. Um, and yet the Associated Press puts out ten times as many stories. So how does a, a news organization with, uh, with a small portion of, of uh, employees of this other uh, news service, Reuters is what I was thinking of. Reuters. Reuters has, like I say, has uh, at least five times more employees and they put out um, about a fifth as many news stories, something like that. I, I don't remember the exact number, but something like that. Five times as many employees, one fifth as many stories. And the reason why that happens is that Associated Press, when you, when the, the, a paper uh, becomes a member of Associated Press, it's an organization, uh, and every member of Associated Press has to share their stories with Associated Press. And if they're good enough, they get on the wire and are shared with all the other newspapers or in America or in the world that are part of Associated Press. And so uh, they, they, even though they only have a small number of paid employees, they have tens of thousands of, of reporters working on their behalf for free. Um, in fact, for better than free because the member newspapers have to pay them money. So the newspapers pay them money but it's not so much money because they also contribute their stories. And so uh, the Associated Press uh, created their own style book. They wanted to make sure that people wrote in a similar style because tens of thousands of people were writing stories for them from different organizations. And they didn't want to have to do a lot of editing of these stories that were being written by professionals. But if they had different styles, they'd have to be re-edited, but for style only. So for example, do you use courtesy titles? Um, you should remember, if you took my history class, that you're supposed to use a person's first name and family name in the first reference to them. Um, so if you're quoting me, you'd quote, uh, you, know, you, you quote T Ken Harvey, you might put the doctor in front of it, or Professor Ken Harvey, the first time you quote me. But if you quote me again in that same story, you no longer call me that. You just call me Harvey, my family name. According to Associated Press, once you quoted me once, I become my family name only, unless you're quoting more than one Harvey. And then there's some other rules for that. Um, but that doesn't happen very often. So you give the whole name, and then you just give the family name thereafter. That's it. Um, so do you use Mr. Harvey in the second reference, or Dr. Harvey? And the answer is no, you don't. Not by Associated Press. They make a rule, you don't do it. You just say Harvey. Well, they want all writers around the world who are part of Associated Press to keep that same style rule. So their book, uh, I will give you a digital version of their 2005 version. Obviously, that's a little bit dated. They don't change that much. They do change a little bit uh, each year. Uh, but it's, most of it's still the same. And so uh, I will give you a digital copy of their 2005. Somebody will actually, actually two people will do presentations from that book just to help you understand what's in there. You will have a copy to look yourself. I'm not going to be real insistent, but we will part one of our lectures and one of the, the, the fourth chapter that you have not gotten into is about editing. And it does review very quickly some of the important style rules, but also some other ways of being a good editor and, and, and how you, you handle copy editing especially. Uh, so AP style becomes important. I will introduce it to you. I will not, um, you know, the newspapers here may or may not use AP style. But even, even many newspapers in the world who change and adapt to their own style, such as the New York Times has its own style book, but most of it's AP style. So they have an entire, entire book, most of which they steal from Associated Press, and they change a few things. Um, our, the new, daily newspaper I worked for, changed like maybe 10 things, I can't remember exactly. They had a, a few changes that they went by AP style, but they had just a few things, such as uh, on second reference, they did say, they did use a courtesy title. 
So it was Mr. Harvey or Mrs. Harvey or Dr. Harvey or whatever in second reference because they wanted to be a little bit more formal. Uh, so that was the local newspaper's decision, but the AP, AP style said, don't do it. When we sent our stories to AP, we had to take that stuff out. We had to re-edit it quickly and change it from our style to their style before we sent them the story. Um, talking about layout and design, again, that's part of what this talks about. We'll talk about it in class, obviously, and it's part of this book also. How do you make a good design? Uh, I'm not going to get into detail there, but uh, part of it is how do you get somebody's attention on a news page? How do you get their attention and then drag them into the story? How do you get them to go back and get their eyes go back and forth? Or will they just kind of go one spot and then go to the next page? Can you use graphics to help get their eyes flowing back and forth? Uh, so you want to get their attention and you want to get their eyes moving around the page and that's part of design. Um, so that's very important. Uh, desktop publishing is the actual, again, use the software, the Quark Express in our, in our case here, to actually now make it electric, create it electronically. Put in the headline, put in the photos, uh, you know, put in the text, uh, maybe make the first letter of, of a story uh, big cap, uh, maybe put in, insert a, uh, what we call, a, well, an insert a, a quote. So you take well, a quote out of the story and you make it big, You've seen this and put it in italics and put a box, shadow box around it or something. It becomes part of your art, but also helps draw people into the story. One of the best quotes out of the story sitting there, um, like enlarged and, and part of the, the graphic appeal to get, people, get people's eyes going back and forth and to draw them into the story. Uh, how do you use, do the captions? You have the photo, now what do you do with the captions? How should you write a caption? Captions very, very important. And so there's a, there's a style for writing captions. You need to know that. Uh, as I said, there's a headlines, there's a style for writing headlines. For example, just real quick, when you write a headline, you know, something in the past, you use a present tense verb in a headline. So if the council, as I mentioned, raises taxes, that's how you say it. Uh, council raises property taxes. So they're using a present tense verb for something that already happened. If they want to talk about the future, then they would say council to raise property taxes. So that's the future. Present tense is the past. Um, so they don't actually, they try to avoid a past tense verb in a headline. Uh, so these are all things about that you need to learn in order to be a good designer and, and you will implement them in your desktop publishing and, and during tutorial days or, or on your free time in the, uh, in the lab. Um, Headlining, I mentioned, already talked about that. Again, visuals are extremely important and becoming more so. Um, the native uh, uh, page, the native advertising page I did for that uh, mayoral candidate, uh, Kotvis, is no longer good design. That was 1973 when I did that. Uh, a lot has changed since 1973. And so there's no longer considered good design. Uh, so. I want to keep you, teach you best practices, best current practices, not what I did in 1973. Very different. Um, and now we want, uh, particularly we want a big element, a big graphic element to draw people into the story. Usually in the, it should be in the upper part of the, of the page. And so you start with a big uh, graphic and then you maybe put something over to the right, say it, it's the, the top one's toward the left, you put another smaller graphic to the right, you make another smaller graphic in the lower left, and you get their eyes going back and forth in what we would call the, the golden triangle. Uh, you, that's in order to get their eyes into every part of your, your page. Um, now we do have to worry about video. Uh, we're not gonna worry too much about it in this class, but uh, as you move the news product online, you clearly have to, we need to be thinking video. Uh, one of my conclusions in my the book I, I co-authored uh, with uh, Shiogi was uh, that was a conclusion. I did a story just on kind of newspaper or news management, uh, what was happening to traditional media. And part of my conclusion was they are not using enough video. Newspapers must use more video in order to get draw their, uh, their audience into their website and make their advertising of value. Video for their news stories, also video uh, for their advertising. Even those that use put video on their news site for the news stories, 
aren't selling video advertising. Video advertising is the most valuable and the most powerful advertising in the world. And they're not selling video advertising. Bad idea. They, have, they need to understand how to compete in the, against Google. They're not, they think they're competing against other newspapers. They're not. Because all of them are dying. They're competing against Google and Facebook. And until they figure out how to compete against Google and Facebook, they're going to keep dying. Um, so anyway, video is very important. We won't get into it uh, in this class. And obviously, uh, you know, learning in uh, online and mobile software and so forth functions is very important. Again, not so much in the class, other than possibly we might. I need to get into it myself and decide if we're going to touch on the capability of Quark Express to produce web pages. Uh, I haven't decided yet because I haven't done it yet. So, um, like I said, I used Quark many, many years ago. Uh, since then, PageMaker and InDesign, I need to experiment with it before I decide it's something we can fit into this class comfortably. So, editing assignments, not all editors do the same thing. Uh, you have a whole bunch of cooks in the kitchen, so to speak, when you put out, especially a larger newspaper, a daily newspaper. Uh, the daily newspaper, when I was there, it's losing its advertising, therefore it's losing its news content as well. Um, McClatchy is the chain, is one of the biggest chains in America, which owned the newspaper that I used to work at, the daily newspaper I worked at. And last year alone, it lost $30 million. And it was bragging about how much better it was doing with its online products but still lost $30 million in one year. So that's not a success story, I don't think. I think they're probably gonna go broke. Actually, I told them that when they, they bought out another chain of newspapers called Knight Ritter uh, a little over 15 years ago. I told them at the time that was the stupidest thing they ever did, and it has been, because buying newspapers when newspapers are gonna go broke is not a good idea. Um, news organizations and their functions, uh, We'll cover that in just a second. And of course, uh, I've already touched a little bit on, on the new and traditional media. As we, as we go along, we'll talk about that. And this is a, would be more of a medium-sized newspaper, pretty similar to uh, the one I worked for, the daily paper I worked for. Uh, again, we had about 50 people in the newsroom. Uh, they weren't all reporters. Uh, I kind of suggested that before. Obviously, they were not. They were a lot of editors. The uh, you, anyway, let me just talk about these different functions. When you get to a bigger newspaper, the Washington Post, before they started losing money, uh, had over 900 people in their newsroom. So the American newspapers were really big and very successful. They were making lots of money uh, now, you know, 15 years ago or, well, even a little less than that, 12 years ago. They were still making lots of money 12 years ago. Uh, but they're not now. They're losing money. Uh, so they have lots of other, when you have 900 people in your newsroom, you're going to have more functions than this. And I'll touch on that a little bit as we go through it. The publisher is the boss. They oversee everything, as I mentioned before. The, the reason why that chain of newspapers papers wanted me to stay was that I was somebody who could be a publisher and understand advertising and news. They couldn't find people that could do both of that, who had both backgrounds. Publisher is in charge by definition of everything. He's in charge of distribution, of advertising, of news content. He's in charge of everything. He is the head honcho. Uh, some people have somebody over that called president. That'd be a bigger corporation usually. Sometimes the publisher is also the president of a corporation. But basically you, you have somebody functioning as publisher is the head of your news organization. Uh, and the entire news organization, not just the, not just the news. So he has much broader responsibilities. Then you get to the editors. The executive editor, not every uh, newspaper has both an executive editor and managing editor. Depends how big it is. But the one I was at that had 50 people in the newsroom and, uh, and 50,000 circulation was big enough that it had both an executive editor who kind of, uh, he didn't get his hands dirty very much. Uh, he did oversee what we call the front page meeting every day. In the front page meeting, key people would meet and decide what would go on the front page. That's why they call it a front page meeting. 
Uh, so uh, I was the uh, wire editor uh, much of the time I was there. I would look for the best wire stories and take them to the front page meeting. Uh, the metro editor uh, is what we called him. Uh, some call him a city editor. Metro editor is, is the editor in charge of the local reporters. In the, the newspaper I was at, that was almost all the reporters. There were just very few other reporters that were not under the responsibility of the Metro editor. Uh, we didn't have, it says here, state or national editor. We didn't have those roles. Uh, the closest thing was me as wire editor. Uh, we got our national and state news primarily from the wire services. We did not send reporters out to cover those. If we had a local angle, you can take an AP story and you can have a local reporter rewrite it with local information and you co-byline it. Uh, you know, if I were to co-byline an AP story, it say by um, Ken Harvey, uh, Herald Reporter, and Jeff Green, uh, Associated Press. So you can go ahead and change their, their stories and localize them and co-byline them if you want to. So we would do that sometimes. But we didn't have, we did during a part, a part of that time have one reporter in the state capitol. Uh, particularly to cover the legislature and to cover local issues. He was the only person, and even he, because he was only by himself, reported to the Metro editor. We didn't have a different editor to cover uh, the state. We had one reporter that was a statewide reporter. That was it. So we were primarily a local news organization. Uh, our national news, our state news, all came from Associated Press uh, with maybe some rewriting. Um, so the, uh, um, again, the executive editor is going to, you know, decide on, on all the positions needed. He's going to manage it in a very broad overview. He's going to head up the, the, uh, the front page meeting, decide what stories should go into the front page. We'd all make our arguments. Uh, even the sports editor might show up. If he had a story that he thought was front page worthy, he might show up and argue that they should put this sports story on page one. That would happen occasionally. Um, the feature editor, we did have a feature editor. She might show up and say this feature story should be on page one. Didn't happen very often, sometimes. Um, the photo editor would show up with his best photos. Uh, we might not, we might put a photo and then refer into a story inside, or in some cases, all we had was a photo and caption, standalone photo. Uh, nobody, we didn't send a reporter out to this accident, but we got a really good picture of this accident. So the, report, the photographer has to bring back, he has to become the reporter in that case, and bring back enough information to write a, a strong standalone caption because there's no story with it. Um, or like I say, if there was a story, it may not be a front page story. It may not be worthy of front page. We put the photo in the front and we refer C story on page. We had four sections, so C story in B2 or something. Uh, B1, uh, B section, page one. Uh, managing editor uh, is more of the hands-on editor. He's all there all evening uh, overseeing everything. He may help a little bit with the Metro desk. Uh, not usually in the copy desk, but the Metro desk, he might help there. Uh, he might be involved talking to the reporters and, and considering important stories that he thinks maybe need some change or something. So he'd be very involved because uh, he's overseeing the whole thing. Again, the bigger the organization, the less involved he can be in any one part of it. But with a mid-sized daily like this one, uh, he might be quite involved. Metro editor, as I said, and, and if, uh, in our case, we also had an assistant. Uh, they um, oversee all the, all the news reporters. They don't oversee the sports reporters. That's The sports editor does have his own staff of sports reporters. That's like a whole different world. And so they operate separately. Um, we had a feature editor who uh, every one of our four sections, A, B, C, and D, was every day a feature section. And so she was in charge of that page one and some other feature stories inside. A lot of it was wire stuff. Some of it she wrote herself. She was a one-person department, basically. Um, so she worked pretty close with our graphics editor. Uh, sometimes some really fancy graphics would be on page one of the feature section. Um, so typically, the, she kind of melded her work into uh, the Metro, or at least uh, handed off to the copy desk to do her copy editing and design and pagination. Her page, her, you know, creating it on page, page maker, 
what a, and then our case, Quark Express. Um, so the Metro editor is concerned about content. He may change, he may do some copy editing in the sense of spelling and grammar, uh, stuff like that. He may do some of that. But his main job is to be concerned about the content, not about the, the exact language. Um, although, he, again, he's in a position he can be concerned about the language. He can do some rewriting if he wants to, uh, but it's the content that he's concerned with. So you have certain content editors, Metro Editor, in, our, in the case of the midsize uh, daily I was at, was the primary um, content editor, plus the sports editor had lots of part-timers under him, plus a couple of uh, full-time uh, staff members. Sports was very, very popular in America. So he was a content editor. Uh, they would hand that off typically to the copy desk then to do the copy editing to make sure the spelling and grammar and everything was okay. They, he was a content editor. So uh, the sports editor is a content editor. Metro editor, a content editor. Uh, if we had a state or national uh, staff, they would be content editors. Uh, bigger newspapers might have an education desk. And so the education editor would be over uh, several reporters and he would, that person would be a content editor. Uh, you might have somebody in the arts in a bigger newspaper. Somebody, the arts editor uh, would have reporters under, under probably more frequently her. Uh, and uh, she would be a content editor. They, there is a discussion, and uh, there might be still some still in this uh, major book, about how do you organize a big daily newspaper? Do you, is it better to assign copy editors to work with these different departments if you have a big uh, organization? Like in other words, you have a content editor for sports, should they have their own copy editor to both do the, to, to do the editing of style and, and spelling and grammar and do the pagination just for sports? Uh, if you had a national editor, uh, would it be better to have them assign certain copy editors to handle their spelling and grammar and, pagin and, and to lay out their, their pages? With, with some of the big newspapers, they do that. Uh, with other smaller newspapers, the copy desk uh, it, it kind of works with everybody that needs their help. Uh, so that's what this was, what, our, what the mid-sized daily where I was at did. They had one copy desk. That's under the news editor. News editor is not a content editor. Uh, we might raise questions of content, that's kind of secondary, but primarily we are a design, uh, spelling, grammar, headliner service. We take all these, uh, take the, the pages from these other organizations, sports pages sometimes, uh, the feature pages, and definitely the news pages, wire pages, locally produced pages, all that sort of stuff. We take those, we make sure that they're, they're in good shape in spelling and grammar, uh, in their basic writing, did they write a good lead? Uh, we're the last stop. The copy editors are the last stop. Uh, and so we have to make sure it's in really good shape. We write the headlines, we put in the pluggers, we put in the blurbs, the pull out quotes, we put in the, we decide how big to make the art, we, we make sure the captions are good, we may write them ourselves or uh, hopefully the, the photographers have written a caption for us. We may rewrite it because photographers are not renowned for being great writers. So the copy desk may rewrite their captions that they send in. If they're incomplete, we may ask them to please give us some more information. Um, because, again, the photographers typically are not hired to be writers. They're hired to be photographers. But they need to be writers also to provide the caption information you need uh, to put in the newspaper. Um, so the, the news editor is the one who assigns out the pages uh, to the other copy editors. So it's kind of a misnomer. It, doesn't, it sounds like a news editor should be in charge of news. They should be a content editor, a news editor. That sounds like a content editor. He's not. He is the head copy editor. And he distributes the, the pages, so he'll assign, uh, he'll, he'll hand out a page to one copy editor and say, okay, you're gonna have these three local stories on this page. He'll, he'll hand out another one 
to me uh, to say, okay, or, well, first off, it goes through me anyway. It says, um, you know, some, maybe another copy editor is going to actually do the, the layout and the, the pagination, but as a wire editor, they're going to want me to give him the stories. What stories should, do I think are highest priority to get uh, on this page? You never have enough pages to put in all the wire stories. Uh, you, you don't have enough pages probably to, in many cases to put in 10% of the wire stories. They're, they're sending you so many wire stories that there's no way to even get a, not even half of them, not a third of them. You're not going to get many of the wire stories in. So the wire editor has to be aware of all the stories coming in. We didn't just have a Associated Press. We also had stories coming in from the New York Times. We had stories coming in from the Washington Post. We had stories coming in from the LA Times. Uh, and I think we had some stories coming in from Chicago uh, Tribune. And so as wire editor, I had to look at all of those and decide where, wh which of these wire stories are going to go in in the very limited space we had for wire stories. So in some cases, the news editor would then give me some pages. We have, you know, put in, go ahead and put your best stuff in these however many pages we had, sometimes not nearly enough. Um, and then the copy editors would, um, and many of us would wear them more than one hat, the news editor would do some pages himself. Me as wire editor would do pages myself. I was also a copy editor, uh, but I had other functions besides being a copy editor. Again, looking uh, as copy editor, you're looking for the spelling, the grammar, the writing, the style, um, and then you're taking it and you're putting it on a page. You're designing your page. You're writing the headlines. You're matching the. the you're putting the photos in. You're deciding how big to make the photos. You're putting the captions in. You're putting, creating that page in a digital format. Uh, then it all comes together, and uh, you send it to the press, wherever that press is, whether it's in-house or whether you're sending it to another organization to do your printing. Um, you may nowadays have a separate online editor. Uh, we did at that when I was there, that function didn't exist any place. That was in the 1980s. So I ended that. I left the daily newspaper in 1992. So just the very, very, very beginning of the World Wide Web uh, when I left the daily newspaper. And still, even 10 years later, they were wrestling with what do we do with online content? Who produces it? Who controls it? Uh, the Washington Post uh, former executive editor said that's one of his challenges, that, that he kind of managed that transition because the regular reporters and the regular journalists did not want to participate in online stuff. They thought that was below them. They thought that was irrelevant, uh, which they were stupid to think that way, but that's the way they thought. And so uh, it took them a while before they made people realize this is one news organization. We have to be involved in everything. We have to be involved in the print product, and we have to be involved in the online product. They're co-equal uh, going forward. Anyway, so when we're talking about functions, not all editors do the same thing. Uh, if you're for a weekly newspaper like me, like my preference was weekly newspapers, then I did all of this. I had to be the reporter, uh, so I did. I had to manage other reporters. Uh, I had to be the copy editor to make sure that stuff was written well, and I was the design editor, and I was the page ma the paginator, the desktop publishing person. I did it all. Uh, I was frequently me also did had thousands of uh, news uh, photos published. So I was also the photographer, the, probably the main photographer in some of in some of the publications I did. So anyway, so depending on your news organization, um, you'll have some, in some cases, smaller publications, all of these responsibilities. In bigger organizations, fewer and fewer of those responsibilities. That's actually why I did not like being a daily editor, uh, particularly a daily wire uh, copy editor, because I had a very small function in the overall thing. I very rarely got to write stories. Rarely got to take photos, rarely got to do lots of stuff I liked doing. And so I, you know, first off, I made that transition to PR marketing, and then I went back to weeklies that I loved uh, a lot more than dailies. Okay, going to, uh, to chapter one of the crash course, um, where do we get news? 
the uh, here's some of the places where you get news. In a daily paper particularly, but also in weeklies, uh, you would have people assigned to certain subjects. So even at the weekly newspaper, I had one person, even though he wasn't even a full-time person, I had one person assigned just to sports. I had one person just assigned to feature stories. I had one person just assigned to news. And then I could do a little bit of all of them. But uh, I would mo normally take the news stories because they were the ones that would end up on the front page and were the ones that were going to attract attention. And why do I want attention? Because I want to be successful. I want to be able to sell advertising and get people's attention. So um, I it mostly, as an editor, I also wrote front page stories, basically. Rarely wrote a story that wasn't going to go on the front page. Um, so, but anyway, you, the bigger the organization, uh, again, the smaller the news beat. So in a daily newspaper, you have one person in, that may cover just the sheriff's department or the city police department. That may be his only job is just cover the police. Somebody else might just be, be assigned with a big newspaper just to cover the fire departments. That's it. Just be a specialist in fire departments. Uh, we, where I was living was close to a nuclear site, the Hanford Nuclear Reservation, that, uh, that produced some of the uh, uh, enriched uranium that was used in the bombing of Japan during World War II. Uh, we had definitely had a, a beat for science and technology because we were in an area that where science and technology was a major part of our, of our economy. And so we had at least one person assigned just to the Hanford Nuclear Reservation because it was so important to our, to our local economy. Uh, so you, you set up your beats for people. Uh, by the way, one of the hard questions, however, is if you set up beats and you keep somebody there for a long time, will they stop being a good reporter? For example, you assign somebody to be to just cover the police. What's going to happen while he's covering the police for 10 years? He's going to become friends of the police officers, right? What happens if a police officer does something wrong? How good of a reporter is he going to be? He may not be a good reporter then because he's friends with the police. So. Uh, some newspapers require their reporters to change positions, uh, change beats every so often, so they don't become too friendly to the people they're reporting on. Uh, otherwise, they are becoming PR people for that that uh, for those people in that beat. So uh, beats are important. So you're you're uh, within that beat. You may be talking about how are a number of these other elements that I'm talking about here. So, for example, issues. Well, what are the issues related to police? Or what are the issues related to city council? What are the issues? You know, so it may be for a big organization, you have issues particular to your beat. Uh, I, again, preferred smaller weekly newspapers where I could write about a lot of different things. And so my issues were bigger, broader issues. So I would be covering the city council and, and covering the ta raise in taxes covering um, the hiring of the new police chief, covering uh, the dispute with the library uh, system, which was a, under a separate government agency, uh, just, you know, just talk, uh, covering the problem with the sewer pipes. Uh, they were leaking sewer into, into, the, the, into the ground around them and losing uh, the water in the process, but also contaminating the soil. Um, as, as a general reporter and a general editor like I was, I had to get involved in all of that stuff, a lot of different stuff. So I am, but in my competing with the dailies, I was going for issues. All, almost all my stories were about issues. Their stories were about meetings. My stories were about issues. Do you understand the difference with that, between that? So they would go to a meeting, they'd report what happened in that meeting and they thought they were done. I'd go to the meeting and I would not report on everything in the meeting because that wasn't the point. I knew they would do that. I reported on the issues. So whether they're raising taxes, uh, firing their police chief, doing whatever the issue was, I had to go in more into depth to cover the issue, co ask those how and why questions to cover the issue, not the event, not the meeting. 
Uh, so I took a very different perspective uh, when I did my writing for a weekly newspaper than I did uh, with a daily newspaper. I went for issues, they went for events, uh, accidents, meetings, all this sort of stuff. They went for uh, uh, events. Um, people. One thing I recommend in chapter one is that you keep a list of contacts. Who are people that I know who might have good news stories uh, because you know whether they're business cards whatever you need to get to keep in mind all the people you know who might be valuable to you in the future and so as a reporter uh, you you keep that card file whatever you want to call it uh, whatever whatever format you may put it into an Excel spreadsheet however you want to manage it you need to remember all the people you have con made contact with because they may be valuable to you in the future and in fact, in some cases, you, one of the things I did, again, in that first job I had is that I would take a city councilman or somebody that, a prominent person, out to lunch. And uh, we'd pay for the lunch and uh, we'd sit down and we'd spend two hours together eating lunch and talking. I had no idea what news story was going to come out of that. But I broke stories like a city councilman deciding to run for, for uh, mayor or one deciding he's going to resign. I broke a lot of stories the Daily Paper didn't have because I was spending time with people and letting them guide this topic. So sometimes it's just the people that are important. You find, figure out the people you want to talk to and they tell you what the story is. Now they have to be people who, who are newsworthy and that you have some reason to think that uh, they will have a, a story for you. Uh, but if that if that person is a city councilman or something like that, you can be pretty confident that if you spend some time with them, you're going to come out of it with a story. You just don't you go into it without knowing what story the story is going to be. But sometimes it can be a scoop, and all the other news media, because you took the time to spend with them, even though you went in blind, you have no idea what you're going to talk about. Basically, I mean, you may talk start off. You may start off. I didn't turn on the. I, plugged it in and I didn't turn it on. Uh, you may start off by talking about his childhood. You may go back all the way to the beginning, have him tell you about all his you know, young life and how he got to where he was at. And then you, you know, they become your friend in that period of time. And by the time they're done, they're telling you stuff that nobody else knows because you've taken some time with them. So sometimes it's just the people are, the pe are what make your story. You don't have any idea what the story is going to be yet. Uh, meetings, as I said, particularly the daily papers are all about meetings. Um, and But you can cover a meeting in different ways, as I said. You can cover a meeting and just tell what happened in the meeting, or you can cover the meeting and make it an issue. Now you cover the issue, not the meeting. So I would go to meetings, not cover the meeting, I would cover the issues. They would go to the meeting and just cover the meeting. I came out with better stories because I would go into more depth, I would ask follow-up questions, I'd ask the how and why questions, I covered the issues. Um, unplanned events, uh, accidents, car accidents, whatever, there are lots of unplanned events, they're still events, uh, those uh, pop up and depending on your priorities as a news organization, uh, there's obviously news stories there. And then the planned events, not just meetings, but like a demonstration. If, if somebody's planned a demonstration, uh, or something like that, obviously that's uh, of, of news value. You're, you, you have that possibility. All of these things can lead to a good news story. Um, you, as a reporter, are trying to keep as many options available as possible. As a news writer, as a, as a reporter, I would typically have at least five stories that I would want to write. And I could not get them all done, probably, usually. But I'd, I'd be thinking about and starting to develop at least five stories at a time. Because one of the problems is, is you work on one and you have a deadline, what's going to happen? Something's going to happen. The, the, a source, a primary source you wanted to talk to is not going to be available. You thought they were going to be available, they weren't. And so if you're covering more than one story, that story gets held for another week or until the next edition or whatever. Because you can't bet your career on one story. And so you're, you're thinking about you know, multiple stories at the same time. And so your first assignment 
will be to come up, I think I end up saying three stories, three stories. Um, come up with at least three story ideas and what, who your sources would be and what sort of questions would you ask. I allow you to do what I did when I rewrote stories of the daily paper. You can go find stories in another news medium and say, I want to rewrite this story, and this, uh, these are the additional questions I would ask and the additional people I would interview. In other words, you have a starting point. I remember, again, with that first uh, uh, job I had, um, I was taking, uh, I was subscribing to a national magazine called U.S. News and World Report. And they, uh, they reported nationally that many construction projects were going over budget. And they were set up contractually in such a way that, that even though that construction company said they would build, they would build this bridge for, you know, fifty million dollars, it ended up costing a hundred million dollars. And so, how'd you get in this situation? They they had a contract to build it for fifty million. So how'd they get to a hundred million? So this was a, a major issue in the 1970s when we had high inflation, that all these contractors were building in escape clauses, uh, but it was really screwing up cities and states and, and other government organizations that they thought they were going to build something for 50 million, it's costing 100 million instead. That doesn't do a lot of good for your budget. Uh, so uh, I then took that national story, I went and talked to the local government, the county and the city officials. Is this happening here? Found out it was happening major, big time in Tampa. And so this was a scoop on the daily papers. They had totally overlooked the, the problem of, uh, of, of over, um, what they call it? Anyway, I've, I have a special word for it that I'm skipping my mind right now, but of, of uh, cost of public, uh, public uh, construction projects going over, over contract um, and destroying their budgets. Uh, so this became uh, a, a, actually a sequence of stories. It became uh, three or four stories by the time I got into it. And again, it was something the daily papers had totally ignored. Major, major story. Um, but it came from a national publication. So sometimes it can be a national publication that can give you an idea, oh, this is national. What about local? Or if it's a local, they cover the event. Well, what's the issue behind the event? So you do what I did. Um, it's uh, even, like I said, a fire story may be a, 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 may end up being an issue story. Why did the fire truck take so long to get there? Why don't they have enough people posted to get that fire truck from site A to site B in time to put out a fire? Uh, so even something like that can end up being an issue story, not just an event, planned or unplanned. Um, so. You know, you can get some ideas from other media, or you can come up with on your own. Uh, for example, here on campus, you might decide to interview a professor, an interesting professor. And so your main story, I'm going to encourage you to have more than one source. So you'd interview the professor, but you'd also talk to his, uh, his department chairman, for example. And then maybe talk to one of his students, one or two of his students. So you get a better perspective. You're not just basing it on one interview of that person, you give it some other perspective. And so in getting a, a, an A on this a project, you're going to want to have more than one source. Uh, but even a feature story like that, a profile of a professor, can have multiple sources, um, and so forth. Okay, so we're running out of time. I know that. Um, questions? We did not actually go through the syllabus today. Um, but, and in fact, it's not even done. <laughs> Some of the most important, the, this week is done, but not the, not the rest. It, uh, they're asking us to do more stuff with it, and uh, I had to go to America. My, my mother died, actually, uh, uh, about two weeks ago. So I had to go to America to, to uh, uh, be with family and so forth. So that kind of screwed up my plan, my work in preparing for this semester. Um, but anyway, all is well. Um, so, um, I'm not totally done with the syllabus. It will be on Moodle, and I'll let you know um, 
I would say that probably the Moodle will, I will have the different news sources and stuff. I'll have it begun. I'm sure that the IT will get me set up with the changes I need today. And so probably as of tomorrow, uh, you'll be able to go sign up for the Moodle site. Uh, I've asked them to please delete all the old students and that that I had under in news editing before. So I don't have to, you know, they won't be in my list of students. Um, and to do a couple other things they need to do. And so it should be available as tomorrow, as of tomorrow. And at least an unfinished syllabus will be on Moodle immediately once I, uh, once I get uh, that set up. So as of tomorrow, you'll see what I have of the syllabus and I'll build that syllabus. Also, some of you from, from my other classes know that I kind of change syllabuses all the time. So I keep adding stuff to it, uh, be, make it more specific. So th there may be things that I don't feel like the syllabus is explained well enough. So I ask you to go back every so often. I'll send out an email to everybody. I just changed the syllabus. Go take a look. I may color the changes in red or something so you can see what changes I made. Uh, but to me, the syllabus is a living document. And so I'll be making some changes throughout the semester. Um, real quick here, one other element uh, thing that I wanted to talk about real quick. We've got two minutes. Um, unless there's questions. Questions first, and then if I have two minutes, I'll finish this one slide. Any questions? Okay, with this one slide then, uh, we already talked about this to a degree, but the, the five W's are uh, who, what, when, where, why, and how. You should know and should remember that I think the most important are who and, and uh, I mean, rather how and why. Um, because they get you to the issues, and they get you to the details that are interesting to the reader. Uh, that doesn't mean you can ignore the others by any means, but those are very, very important. Um, also, let's see. I guess I did leave one out that I one slide out that I wanted to share with you also. I don't. Oh, there it is. That one. Okay. News values. Uh, real quick. Uh, the 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 how and the why are particularly important for consequence and curiosity. Detail is really important for, for curiosity. Give me the details of something. Uh, for example, if it was a crime. Give me the details of the crime. Tell me exactly how the, the robbers busted into the, the store and, and with their shotguns and their ski masks over their faces or whatever they did. Give me the details that answers my curiosity. Consequence is what is it going to do to impact me? We're getting back to the issues. That's where the why question is really important. How to some degree, but why is really important. Why did something happen? Uh, why hasn't something been prevented? Why, why, why get you more into the issues of something? And so in my, uh, in my list, this is totally mine, uh, of news values, consequence and curiosity are the things that are going to grab the attention and make your story better than somebody else's most of the time. Uh, suspense and humor. Again, suspense can come with detail. If you find a story with, with, that is funny, that's always a value. Uh, if you have something with suspense, that's always a value. So if you find those elements, you do want that story. Um, pathos and love, whether it be uh, uh, you know, dog, uh, the story of the dog that got ran over and somebody saved it and nursed him back to health, or whatever. Animal stories, things like that. Pathos and, and uh, love are important. They're not unimportant. They're very, very important. Timeliness and proximity. Let me just talk about that a second. Timeliness means that it's why I wrote my stories in, about issues, because I knew I could not beat the daily newspapers in timeliness. The, the city council meeting happens on Tuesday. If I'm lucky, I might be uh, in, on press by Thursday, but the daily paper out, is out on the press on Wednesday. So they're going to beat me at least by one day, and maybe by five days. Uh, I did not have a timeliness angle. If you have the opportunity to beat somebody else with timeliness, you want it. If you don't, then that's one reason why I go to magazine-style writing, and I use a lot of present tense attribution, says, 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 rather than said, 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 because I'm writing, uh, trying to make it timeless, trying to cover an issue and make it timeless. Make the story of interest, whether you write it today or write it or read it today or read it two weeks from now. 
Make it interesting no matter when you read it. That's what you should be thinking about that, by the way, because when we get, this will not probably go up on our Facebook site until the end of the semester. Your stories and, and the, the desktop published versions of your stories. Therefore, your stories should probably be timeless. Don't make them too time sensitive uh, because then, they, then uh, at the end of the semester, they'll, nobody will want to read them. So you have to think about the timeliness. Uh, in our case, timelessness in this, in this class. Uh, proximity is something close to us is more of interest than something far away. So something that is happening in, uh, you know, here in, at, at Shiman is much more interesting than something that's happening at Harvard, unless it's a huge, huge event. We're not, you know, yes, Harvard's important, and in America it might be in the front page. Here, Shiman's in the front page. So proximity is important to us. There's also cultural proximity in the sense that if somebody's uh, in America, you find very, it's, by the way, it's not a good thing, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but there are, Africa is totally underreported in American newspapers. Now, you're underreported too, so is Malaysia. But all the entire African con continent is pretty much underreported in American newspapers. Why? Because of cultural be uh, distance. Their culture is so different that Americans don't relate to them. And therefore, a newspaper figures out if we write to put a bunch of stories in here about Africa, nobody's going to read them. There's going to have to be a really big story. One of the cynical ways I put this is how many Africans have to die in order to make the front page or to kick a story of five people dying in a car accident locally in a daily, local daily newspaper. How many Africans will have to die to replace this, the story of five local people dying? It might be 200,000. I don't know, it would be a whole bunch of them uh, would have to die in order to replace my local story about five people dying in a car accident. Lots of Africans would have to die. So the cultural and other distance. Okay, we're out of time. Uh, think about these things. We'll talk about them and actually, actually get into work. Uh, get to work uh, during your tutorial sessions this week. Uh, and like I said, as of tomorrow, you should be able to sign into Moodle, get signed up for your Moodle site, and there'll be stuff there for, to, for you to look at, including the syllabus. Perhaps not finished, but started. Thank you.